Welcome everyone, this is Dustin Garrick and this is a webinar on the demonization of male sexuality. I want to go over just a couple of quick uh, logistical pieces for those of you who have never used this software before. I keep uh, muting the attendees uh, primarily just to uh, keep our all of our background noise from becoming a big cacophony. Uh, ultimately, you can unmute yourself if you hover your uh, your cursor over the video screen. You should be able to see a, a microphone button on the bottom left side. Um, so at at different points, we can um, you know do some Q and A. Uh, or otherwise, if you have something to say, we can bring you in there as well. I'll most likely unmute you. So. Uh, additionally, uh, if you, there's a chat box that uh, just welcomes you all in. And if you bring your cursor over the video screen, you should see a little chat button at the bottom. So those are the main things to be aware of. On the top right-hand side of the screen, you can see a little like tic-tac-toe board or keypad. And you can click that to change your view, everything from the speaker view where you see me or whoever is speaking, or a view where you see all the little boxes of uh, different people who are on uh, the call at the same time. With that said, I'd like to dive in and get us started. Uh, if at any point you do have a question or something to add, please use the chat box. Uh, we've had some really fantastic conversations taking place in this chat box before. And more than anything, I would like for the <clears throat> uh, I would like for this webinar to be interactive. So I welcome your, your, uh, your voice. I welcome your questions or things that you would like to have addressed. Please just add it into the chat box or um, just mark in there if you want to uh, you know, speak it. So I put out this webinar, The Demonization of Male Sexuality, and I got some you know, pushback. Uh, basically along the lines of, um, you know, what are you talking about of uh, the demonization of uh, male sexuality? Male sexuality is, um, is held up. It is what is normalized. Um, it's uh, female sexuality that's misunderstood or has been repressed or neglected. And um, my answer, to put simply, is yes and uh, my general approach when it comes to what I'm looking at as the battle of the sexes or the gender war is that it's not a zero-sum game. Um, the, uh, all too often, we turn it into a, an us versus them uh, conversation. Um, or it, the media certainly loves to do the, uh, the men versus women type of a, a game. But it's a losing game, and it's a game we've been playing for far too long. I believe that what we really need to be doing, or what will really serve us best, is going to be to um, uh, find those, build those bridges of empathy and compassion and understanding for one another. I've spent the past few weeks posting a lot and creating videos a lot, basically trying to help men understand some of the things that women have are are dealing with regarding particularly uh, their feeling of safety, um, how prevalent things like uh, sexual assault, coercion, and trauma are. And um, because honestly, it's epidemic proportions and far more than most people, especially most men, really give it credit for. Because I believe that if we really, if men, if men really, really understood how prevalent uh, such uh, traumas and feeling a lack of safety uh, and sexual assault are for women, we would rise up and act, and do something. In fact, many women, many women are either explicitly or implicitly <coughs> calling for men to do just that. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm doing what I can in that regards. However, one thing that I've seen is really problematic, the way that it's often presented, both by the media as well as uh, uh, many women, as well as other men, is that in this conversation about uh, you know, the uh, 
what's going on with uh, the Julian Blanc uh, pickup artist controversy to the uh, Jean Gomeshi uh, CBC can, uh, Canadian uh, host getting uh, fired for sexual violence against women to these Bill Cosby conversations is that what we're what we're seeing is well, I see it as a, a demonization of male sexuality when the only conversations that we're having uh, about male sexuality are uh, highlighting men behaving badly, um, men as perpetrators, men as uh, you know those that carry out sexual assault, men as uh, the violent ones, aggressors, etc. And I do believe very strongly that that. Um, the problem, uh, the vast majority of those that commit uh, sexual violence are men. And that I do think that it is for men primarily to hold each other accountable and for us as men to help create that shift. However, I, I, I'm concerned that we're putting up all these negative examples and uh, uh, creating a lot of blame and shame when it comes to men and their sexuality and what not to do. But we're not really giving much attention to, okay, so if not this, then what? Um, if uh, what I've been finding with a lot of the men that I end up working with is that somewhere along the lines uh, in their development as a child or in adulthood, they got that they took on this message that uh, the masculine or being a man is inherently bad is inherently a problem a problem is inherently harmful and uh, made some sort of decision consciously unconsciously of okay so i'm not going to be that but somehow in the process they've lost touch with some aspect of their own masculinity or what it means to be a man themselves and I speak of that, I'm saying they a lot, but the truth is this really is, uh, is my journey. Um, it wasn't until my late 20s that I, really, that I started realizing how off I was, how something was really imbalanced within me, and ultimately realizing it's that I really had no concept of, uh, of what it means to be an empowered man in the world, and especially in a sexually empowered man in the world. And what does that look like? And how does one do that without being harmful? Uh, look, just to get a little straw poll, has this, have any of you <laughs> uh, grappled with any aspect of this? <laughs> so, yeah, see, so... Some enthusiastic raising of hands as well as some smiles and nods. And I'm glad that we have a mixed group of, uh, of men and women on this call. And Tony, I see you writing yes all the time. Um, I took on a challenge to myself at the end of 2006 for 07 to be the year that I actively explored my masculinity and what it means to me to be a man in the world. When I took it on... I had no idea just how profound a, a change that was going to create in my life and how much of a transformation uh, I was going to experience. The, challenge, the biggest challenge was I didn't really feel like I had good role models. I didn't know where to look. Um, I was at best looking for parts of of attributes or virtues in different men that I liked because I, I just felt that the the major messages that I I received growing up around what it means to be a man were just not things that I connected with and often were things I didn't want to connect with um, so this is the time where for those of you who have been following me for a while um, you know that there were there was a seven year period where I was playing with this moniker or really this archetype that I dubbed the erotic rock star. Um, I don't really use it so much these days. Primarily, I just kind of feel like I've graduated, I guess you could say. But at the time, it was an incredibly powerful exploration for me. Uh, he was an archetype, meaning uh, an idea, a 
a character, a pers persona that I created from my imagination. And primarily, I created him from a place of what I felt I wasn't. Um, finding those, the, where I felt limited, he had limitless possibility. Where I felt uh, disempowered, uh, he was completely empowered. He was, it took me quite a long time to start to uh, sort out exactly, well, who is this being? And the truth is, what ended up being so powerful about it was that I had these ideas of who I am and who I'm not what I'm capable of and what I'm not capable of. But he, and I keep using the word he for a reason, uh, this erotic rock star was a figment of my imagination. So he could be anything, anything. So all those limitations I held on myself, they didn't matter here because he was a made up myth. So I started playing with idea and honestly, I got obsessed about this. I got very like, I would think about this constantly. I would talk to everybody who would bear listening to me about it. I would dream about it. I would write incessantly about it. And I, over time, what developed was this vision of this man who was centered and grounded primarily because I wasn't that at the time I was super high energy, but erratic with my energy. And um, <laughs> I think I barely had a concept of what it meant to be centered and grounded at the time. He was centered and grounded. He held, he held safe space, meaning women and other men felt safe when they were around him, and he felt safe and secure within himself, first and foremost. He had a strong sense of self-worth. He knew who he, he knows who he is and what he, and what he stands for and what he's here to do. He has his finances sorted out and he understands how to move through this material plane. He's really owned his sexuality. He knows he's not afraid of any aspect of his sexuality anymore. He, uh, had, endlessly explores his sexuality. He experiences his sexuality as a gift to both himself as well as those with which he plays. He's endlessly creative and lives his life as art, as artistic expression itself. He's found his sense of personal power and day by day cultivates that deep personal power from within. No longer attached to that, that false power of trying to like find power over others which is that old paradigm masculinity, but rather cultivates it from within, finds that deep well of limitless power that exists within him and increases it on a day-by-day -day basis as well as uh, helps draw out the power of others. He's really connected to his heart. He walks through the world with an open heart. He's no longer afraid of his heart. He's no longer afraid of... Uh, his sensitivity, but has found strength in his sensitivity. Has found the gifts in his sensitivity. He is strong enough to truly love and to allow love in. He is fully self-expressed. He can speak his truth without fear. He knows he, he knows he can communicate and maintain his desires, his fears, his boundaries. He has a strong intellect and uh, continuously uh, cultivates that as well, but he also cultivates that stillness of the mind and is more and more connected to that deep, that intuition that comes, that knowing that comes without thought. And he is a spiritual man. He has cultivated a strong connection to source. He embraces that connection and what experiences life as a walking of his, of his spiritual path. It's quite an archetype to play with. Now that came about over time. I mean, some of that came about over years. 
It was a little bit more simple at first and then just kept getting added to. The challenge, one of the challenges that came with this journey was again, like there were those inner fears of, well, how do I own my sexuality? How do I, especially what, like he really came into his full fruition uh, after a breakup with, a, with my former fiance. And now I'm this, this uh, single man who is claiming his sexuality. How do I engage? How do I engage that's not, you know, that's not creepy, that doesn't turn me into that guy? And um, truth is, I erred. You know, I think that it's the way that uh, people find their, their path with anything. They find their path by sometimes wandering off the path and then realizing, oh, I think I'm lost. Wait, let me get back there. So finding compassion for yourself on, the, on this process for both your entire life history, everything that brought you here to this moment, as well as the direction that you're going. Being able, being willing to make mistakes. This, I think, is also one of the things that I found valuable at the time when I was playing with this, this character or this archetype was that there was a certain element of me feeling, at least for quite a while, feeling this wasn't me. So if he made mistakes, well, he's making those mistakes. <clears throat> Ultimately, I found that there is an incredible value or a necessary step that I didn't get for many years of, of how to reintegrate so that all these lessons that I, l I learned uh, would come back into, into the core of who I am. So I didn't want to pretend. I didn't want to be something fake. Uh, authenticity is something that was very important to me. But uh, I ultimately looked at as all these limitations that I put on myself of all the ways in which I was afraid to express myself, all these ideas of what I thought I wasn't. I mean, those are no more real than that he is. Uh, there's this quote from, from Osho, a spiritual uh, philosopher and teacher, who, that says, all personality is mask. Good personality, bad personality, the personality of the saint, the personality of the sinner. Uh, none of it is who you really are. You're not, uh, you're not the clothes that you wear. You're not the skin that you're in. You're not the personality that you try to project into the world or you like people to think of you as or that they do think of you as. You're not any of that. You are this core essence that exists underneath all of that. This core essence from which all of those things spring forth. We can't confuse those things that spring forth from it from that essence itself. And that essence has limitless possibility. Limitless possibility. Limitless expression. And so much of who, how we move through the world and who we think of ourselves as are nothing but habits. And a lot of it, bad habit. Habits that we picked up along the way, often in response to a sometimes hostile world. But I believe that part of really finding our, our power is, is l learning to listen to that inner voice more and more and explore where is my truth? Where is my expression? If I were not to succumb to uh, being in reaction to all these past experiences, who would you consciously create yourself to be? I, I noticed that things are a little quiet today, uh, though a couple of people have, <laughs> have sent me uh, uh, messages on here privately. I would really invite you, unless you're asking something that you feel is really personal, and really private, and you're not comfortable sharing, please keep it on send to all. Um, uh, anytime you write something in there, it helps encourage other people to do the same. Um, I'd like to, uh, to hear from, uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, how does, how have you personally been impacted by, uh, by you know, what I'm referring to as the demonization of male sexuality?
and I know we also have a couple, a few, actually quite a few women on the call as well. And I, I welcome your voice as well. Uh, Rick wrote, lack of trust from the other gender. Um, okay, we'll, we'll start to touch into that. Please keep them coming and uh, even more so if you're willing to uh, uh, have your voice heard on here. Um, lack of trust from the other gender. I, there's a number, there, there's a lot to address in here. The, the first piece, I honestly, there are ways in which I feel that as a culture where we've come to grips with our racism uh, or the history of, of uh, racism and its impacts more than we have with our sexism still. So I'm going to use that as an example. Uh, like for there to be any real healing, um, real uh, integration and connection between uh, uh, you know, between all people on this planet, I personally believe that uh, th those who have come from the, uh, um, you know, who have uh, the history of privilege in their, uh, in their genealogy, um, that we first and foremost need to own and recognize, like, what, what that history is. Uh, you know, like, for starters, you know, just as an example, um, uh, we're still celebrating Columbus Day, and um, whereas we have a, gr a greater and greater uh, widespread understanding that this country was uh, was built on genocide uh, and then slavery. So, likewise, though, we have a very lengthy history around uh, what we'll call patriarchy of a uh, of male dominant role of this planet. And while we're in a time period where things are shifting and women are rising up like never before, A, that transition is going to be messy, and it is, and is going to come with, um, thank you, Sharon, I'm going to bring you in in just one moment. Um, and it's going to be messy, but it's also, uh, it's our opportunity to first Sorry, I got lost for a moment. Give me one second. We have a history of this, this patriarchy. We have women who are rising up in, in different ways, but I think that it's important for us to really understand, recognize, and get, like, uh, that history didn't just go away. The fact that we're, like, you know, a couple generations into... Um, some real progress for uh, women's empowerment in this country. Um, the the history is still there, and it's still, it you know, it's still unfolding. Things are changing, but it's still unfolding. And so I, I think that when we have this distrust, uh, like widespread distrust of women um, towards men, there is the individual impact uh, that she's experienced in her life, but there's also the collective and his, uh, historical uh, that she's responding to, whether consciously or unconsciously. So the question to me is more of, well, what can we do about that? I'm really thrilled to see that uh, there's now a lot of conversation happening, but uh, before I get into the things that are written, uh, Sharon, are you there? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can. Right. So it I'm looks really like your audio issues. only. That's okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm having issues. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, what I was just um, going to, to quickly point out, I need to try to sort my computer out here, but um, I have a lot of single women friends, and they're very cynical and very mm -hmm. scarred. And you know what? A lot of it, well, I shouldn't say a lot of it, a fair amount is down to poor choices, um, poor partners, bad experiences, baggage from the past. So not necessarily of a man's doing, mm -hmm. not necessarily of their own doing, but they do allow themselves to be victims. Mm -hmm. And that it perpetuates into the relationships with men and then men get the backs up don't want to have anything to do with these women because they see them as scarred and you know too much baggage. So it does go around and around and around. 
Yeah, and one of the uh, one of the things that I would like to see shift in our in our cultural conversations around this whole uh, gender war, uh, it is I do think that there has been too too much emphasis on a victimization of of women. Um, I think that there it's important to like I'm doing here as well, highlighting like where the problems are and what needs to be addressed. However, uh, in that uh, in addressing it, uh, I think it's important to not remain in victim mentality. And it's not just with women. I mean, like that this is just has to do with how we engage with life. Uh, it, there's a danger in get in any of us getting stuck in in a victim-minded mentality, which ultimately can be incredibly disempowering. It is, definitely. Ooh. Sorry about <laughs> definitely that. Definitely is. Um, that's it. <laughs> no problem. Um, that's it for now. I, okay, gonna, no worries. So Thank you very much, Sarah, for, for bringing that in. Um, so I'm just going to address some of these things that have come up in chat. Uh, all right. I find that when I desire to interact with women, they often feel fearful until they get to know me. So notice that one of the things that, that I brought in when I was describing this archetype that I worked with was this um, was creating a safe space. He held safe space and how one big part of that involves really finding that place of deep security within yourself that any fearfulness that you carry, any nervousness that you carry, any uh, part of you that's like, am I okay? Am I enough? Is this person going to validate me and accept me? Uh, those things consciously or unconsciously are felt, uh, especially uh, women tend to be extremely, uh, you know, sensitive, uh, feeling based. And so again, whether it's, uh, whether it, it's thought of consciously or not, it can really be felt and that can uh, really just put off or make a, a, a women often pull back. Frederick wrote, not making a move when I should have. Um, uh, consider that a practice, you know, and, and as far as making a move, it, it's, it's more, what I found, it, it, it's more about what can be really helpful and this is, this is a, a practice, is getting out of the head space of what should I do and should I approach or not, and trusting in yourself first and foremost in your own worth and your own value. And this is not a little thing. This is a big thing. Trusting first and foremost in your own worth, your own value. And, uh, and then from there, being able to sink into your body and what you feel. And when you're, the more you can feel in your body, the more you can feel into like what she is feeling and what she's experiencing. And some of this is, is kind of, we'll call it advanced work, but there is a place that you can get to where you can really start to feel how open she is for what you have to offer and how much she's wanting you to make that move or that, that next step. And there's something to be said for uh, being able to feel into the, the, the pacing that, that's, uh, that she can really be comfortable with. Because when you overshoot that pace, that can often be what creates the uh, contraction on her part or the push away or make her feel unsafe. But that really is a practice. And unfortunately, you know, it's often a practice that we learn by uh, making mistakes in the process. Mehmet wrote uh, not being able to approach and communicate. Um, so these things all, I think, come back to, again, the, the effect being the, the fear, the fear of being that. The, um, having your own ideas or vision of, uh, of what male sexuality is or uh, of it being too much or harmful or, or what have you and a fear of being that. So I'd really invite you, and this is a practice I'd really like you to take on, would be how can you, um, how can you practice oh, creating your own vision of right now there's a vision that you go to of too much. There's a vision that you go to of being rejected. 
there's a, a vision that, of, that you go to of, uh, of that guy. And whether utilizing uh, that, some version of that archetype that I started describing earlier, you don't need to call it your erotic rock star, I don't even anymore, um, uh, but something that you can really identify with. And as you like, but some vision that, that you can really strengthen your connection to so that as you, uh, so that instead of going into those, those fear type places, you have a positive vision that you can direct your mind. Um, we need to accept each other, as you say, as authentic selves. Um, uh, I believe that one of the biggest answers in this uh, ending of the battle of sexes really is building bridges of empathy, compassion, and understanding uh, between men and women. Leo, when you speak of making mistakes, there's a fi very fine, almost impossible line to define between making mistakes, reaching a boundary, and stopping versus... Ver Sorry, this just moves when somebody typed in. Versus reaching the boundary and not knowing that that was a boundary. That mistake becomes a transgression many women are hurt by and have to live in fear of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I used to get teased quite a bit for my sensitivity. And my sensitivity was something I learned to uh, fear or think was a negative thing throughout much of my life. It wasn't until later in adulthood that I came to realize that my sensitivity was where my great gifts lie. And um, I know that I'm not the only one on this call who, who has a strong sensitivity. And I invite you to shift your relationship to your sensitivity and start looking for what are the gifts that exist within there and how you can utilize that sensitivity to feel what she's feeling how you can utilize that sensitivity to um, know what's next. And now part of, a necessary part of that is, is uh, getting out of the head chatter. Because if you're stuck in, you know, the mind, you know, screaming about whether you should do this and what's going to happen, you're, you're not going to be able to feel. Uh, sink into your feeling. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to move through some of this a bit. Some of your, your conversations between each other, that's wonderful. Culture of fear of each other. Absolutely, there's a culture, culture of fear of each other. And the fact that you're on this call, you're already in a, in a very small minority. So I invite you to really take it on as leadership. It, for this culture of fear of one another to shift, it is going to take leaders. It's going to take people who are brave enough to put down the weapons, to put down the armor, and to stand as a, a, a force of love in a culture of fear. And the more that you can do that, the more that you can be that, commit to that, open, have a practice of opening your heart, even when you feel fearful or maybe especially, um, you have the ability to impact each person that you come into contact with, each fearful person you come into contact with. And it doesn't mean that be their punching bag. It doesn't mean don't have boundaries. Notice that was part of the archetype uh, that I described as well. The feeling, um, sometimes the most loving thing that you can do is walk away. But it's still there. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to open up, I'm going to bring somebody el um, else in line who keeps uh, sending me private messages and would like to uh, speak to an aspect of, uh, of male sexuality that's uh, kind of a big issue in our larger topic, I mean, in our larger culture. Um, one thing I, I am going to need to keep, uh, just remind you of, Matthew, uh, I have 25 minutes remaining to this entire call, and I have an arc here. But I, my request to you is... Um, I agree. I think that what you want to bring forward is very important. And how can you uh, share it with us as 
you know, succinctly yet powerfully as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. <clears throat> so um, I, I really appreciate the invitation to speak about this topic. That means so much to me personally, which is, I call it partial penis amputation. I don't like using the word circumcision because that's a metaphor that doesn't really get at what's actually happening. And when we talk about the demonization of male sexuality, and as Destin so eloquently talked about earlier, patriarchy and, and the history um, of, of our culture around sexuality, this is such an important part of it. Um, most people don't know that um, partial penis amputation got started in this country as a way to prevent boys from masturbating, mm. from making love to themselves. Um, and or I should say prevent, but as a uh, discouragement, <laughs> the idea that if we did this to boys, they would masturbate less. And this actually happened at the same time in the late 19th century that chopping off uh, female clitorises was happening on a widespread basis for the same reason. In the 1950s, there was this wonderful feminist revolution in this country, and, and we saw the basically more or less the end of clitoris amputation and even now a federal law that makes it illegal to do that to baby girls. But baby boys aren't protected in the same way. So, so men's male sexuality is demonized because what's happening is the most sexually pleasurable part of the penis is being amputated from an infant without his consent. And when I learned the truth of what had been done to me, I was so enraging and I was grief stricken and I've spent many years in depression about this. And most men just don't know what they've lost. If, 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 if you, for example, have had a surgery on you when you were an infant that removed your ability to see in color, you know, the world is still beautiful and black and white. Like sex is still, is still great with what I have yeah. left, you know, but if you've never ever seen color in your whole life, you just don't know what you're missing out on. And the, the way I now know what I've missed out on is I've seen videos of men who are fully intact, making love to themselves and literally giving themselves three unique types of orgasm that the rest of the penis is not physically capable of, three unique types of orgasm. You know, if you ask what is the most sexually pleasurable part of a woman, most people will say the clitoris. If I ask everyone on this call, what is the most sexually pleasurable part of a man, I'm guessing probably 95% of the people on this call would not be able to answer that question. The most sexually pleasurable part of a man is called the Freenar band, also known as the rigid band. It's at the very tip of the penis, and it's always amputated through this procedure known as circumcision. So just to have awareness of what is possible in a man's sexual body, and then to respect men's bodies just as much as we respect women's bodies. I mean, we would never, ever, ever consider doing something like this to a baby girl in our culture. I mean, just women on this call, just close your eyes and imagine for Nothing. a moment. I, okay, uh, yeah, I think I made my <laughs> point. That was a little longer than succinct, but thank you for... Uh -huh. Uh, I'm going to respond to and, and address some of this, and uh, you know, I really want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate your your passion. Um, I uh, I agree. I do. I believe very strongly that uh, that uh, male circumcision is um, well barbaric and uh, something that I hope that we leave in our past. Uh, I, when it comes to the demonization of male sexuality, it is a, a good uh, symbol of how, for all the ways in which um, we tend to think of, uh, the ways in which we tend to think of uh, male sexuality as being the standard, it's a distorted standard. Um, our concepts of, of what's put forth as uh, male sexuality is, um, you know, I believe is, is quite distorted, and especially when once you factor in the circumcision issue, most, what, most men in the United States anyway, not the world, but in the United States are circumcised. So our, uh, when, you ampu when you amputate part of uh, the genitals of most of the population, you know, most of one sex of the population, you're going to inherently change the sex act itself. 
So um, <clears throat> to uh, so there's just a lot of other things. Um, uh, there, there was a lot in there. I'm not going to address all of it right now. Uh, I invite you all uh, uh, to look further into the topic itself. Just yesterday, uh, the uh, the CDC, I believe it was, just came out in uh, essentially in favor of male circumcision, if, um, which is the first uh, outwardly positive uh, recommendation towards uh, male circumcision made by a, a medical body in a very, very long time and uh, uh, not something that's backed up in uh, anywhere in Europe or, uh, uh, well, in any culture that's not already circumcising, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, yeah, Frederick uh, lives in Sweden. He wrote, we think it's so weird that most males are circumcised in the U.S. Um, it's, you know, virtually unheard of there. Uh, so, uh, while that could be a call in and of itself, um, we do have an arc here. I want to uh, move forward. I, again, invite you all to contact Matthew directly or, um, uh, or just do your own research into it if it's something that uh, you know, piqued your interest. Sharon wrote, uh, with the recent resurgence in feminism, uh, the door is open for misandry, misandry being uh, the opposite of misogyny, so like the hatred or fear of men. Um, I feel the key, as, as you said, is self-knowledge. Why do I act out towards men? Why am I cynical, uh, fearful? Oh, am I cynical, fearful? Uh, yes. Um, stand in your true form, even if you stand alone. Uh, I really appreciate you, Sharon, for sharing that or for being on, on this call and all the women who are on here because th this... Men's issues aren't just men's issues. Women's issues aren't just women's issues. And uh, you're right, like, there is a definite set <laughs> of the feminist movement today that, um, you know, you could call misandrist, uh, that has basically gotten locked into the anger and rage and uh, fear and, and hatred of men, often due to uh, trauma. Um, and again, I believe that we need a place in our society for rape, for feminine rage, uh, for rage period. But the, in, the trick, so to speak, is not getting stuck there. And that's my concern with what I see is, is kind of like getting stuck in that anger and rage. And personally, I don't believe that, um, that we create the, the world that we want to live in primarily through uh, through rage. I, I, I'm committed to creating the world that I want to live in through love, really, through finding connection, by creating a greater understanding, compassion, empathy between men and women. And uh, again, as a man, I think that uh, one of the things that we could really do in service of women is being is learning to be able to hold space for a woman's anger without simply being a punching bag to it, but um, uh, allow it, allowing it. And it's how do you allow yourself to feel anger and rage and let it move through you? And what are you moving towards? So I think that's important as we... Uh, as we move through this is to first get clear, like where, what does, uh, what does that uh, demonization of your own sexuality look like in your life? How do you, uh, how do you demonize male sexuality? And what would it look like? What would it look like for you to be free of that? What would it look like for you to be truly uh, just fully expressed in with your sexuality, to relate to your sexuality as a gift, to uh, as something that's not done to a woman or to a man, to anybody, but rather something that you share 
with one another. That's a core part of uh, who you are as a human being and something that you have to share with this other human being just as much, just as valuable, if not more so than, uh, than what you do for a living or what you could provide in other means. It's a gift of being able to connect. It's a gift of being able to open. It's a gift of being able to, uh, to provide pleasure and as well as to read the gift of being able to receive pleasure. So these are all areas that um, we're going to be exploring in uh, much greater depth in uh, at Evolve Live, a spiritual sexual transformation, uh, the uh, big like 300 person uh, transformational event that I'm doing in January 16th to 18th in the Los Angeles area. Uh, whereas this uh, webinar has been largely informational. You know, I've done some things intentionally to just kind of leave the direction of, you know, kind of drop things into the back parts of your mind to kind of let them spin around and hopefully work their magic uh, during this call. Places that you're thinking, you know, allowing your unconscious mind to be working on what might be possible, who you could be, what your own vision of your, your own archetype, your own uh, uh, imagined ideal that you could play with and step into and express yourself as and what that would look like and be like. About um, within Evolve Live, we can we will be running a, a much deeper process that will allow you to get in touch with this being, with this part of you really, at a much deeper level uh, so that you can get a sense of who, he, not only who he really is, but what it feels like to embody him. Um, and some uh, guided visualizations and hypnotic elements to help you drop him into your psyche um, so that you can have access to him uh, what so that you can leave behind your own demonization uh, fully own and claim uh, your sexual birthright not from a, a sense of uh, this this is something I'm entitled to this woman this woman's body this woman's sex um, but rather for, um, but rather that you have a birthright of experiencing pleasure in your body, you have a, a right to your own body, and that you have this unique gift that you have to share. And uh, your gift is going to be different than my gift but you have a unique gift to share and how to more deeply embrace and honor that gift and how to share that uh, uh, with others. While the event is uh, more or less non-explicit, uh, you know, it is a, a co-ed event of men and women and uh, you'll be doing a lot of engagement with both other men as well as uh, between men and women that will uh, let you uh, well, build a, not just hear about building these bridges, but uh, be guided through exercises and experiences where you can really feel uh, a shift, a, a, a tangible shift in how you relate to yourself, how you relate to women, how you relate to your sexuality, how you relate to your spirituality if you have, uh, if you have one, and find yourself uh, integrating mind, body, and spirit in yourself, in your body, in your heart, in your sex. I like to open this up for any uh, remaining questions or shares that uh, that you may have. Akasha has just uh, wrote in here. Earlier, you mentioned coming from a secure place inside to connect. That is the key. I think for those of us who have experienced issues around consent and have felt pushed without being asked first. It is profound to experience someone truly being present without agenda. Everything you have shared here today is part of that learning to be authentic and secure and available, consciously mindful. Thank you. So um, that element of being present without agenda, that's huge. That's huge. Uh, one of the things that I think is really problematic in our larger society and with our uh, 
or the ways in which we depict and showcase uh, male sexuality is we've trained men to have a scarcity mindset when it comes to women and sex. This idea that there's not enough, and there's never going to be enough, and there could never be too much. So we have the meme of, of men being like dogs when it comes to sex. You know, if sex is waved in front of their face, it's just like, <laughs> yes, please. And um, this isn't helpful. This is, uh, this is a case with, uh, it's like with food or with money. If you're in scarcity mindset, if you're in there's not enough mindset, you, well, people just don't act their best selves. You're not your best self when you're in scarcity. When you're feeling open and expansive, when you feel full, when you feel abundant, when you feel there's more than enough, tend to come from a place of peace, of generosity, of really getting, uh, being able to feel and connect into this other person and respond rather than react. And so that being present without agenda means like, can you be in, can you be, you know, alone in a room, uh, maybe even romantically with a woman and how do I put this? Be able to be fully present there with her feeling. You may, you know, you may have a direction you'd like things to go and you may even help lead things in that direction. But can you do so without attachment? Where you can re remain in connection with her and feeling, is this, is the opening there? Is this opening there for this next step in, the, in this direction? Um, rather than I need to somehow push to get it there or get around her defenses in one way or another. Uh, it's more of, uh, I'm a big fan of what I call enticing desire. How can you instead draw out her desire rather than getting her to succumb to your desire? Women are sexual creatures. We're finally getting that. Wonderful. Since they are sexual creatures, how do you engage with their sexuality? How do you turn her on? Dropping into your presence was a great starting point. Feeling your, uh, uh, your masculine ground. Uh, if you can feel in your place of comfort with your sexuality, meaning uh, there's no part of you that's feeling like you have to uh, shut down your sexuality, nor is it uh, grasping, reaching, and needing something from outside, but uh, rather your sexuality is like an energy that's, that's emanating from you. It's something that you can allow to, to flow from you. You are turned on and you neither need to do something with it nor shut it down. It's just being with it. We have these things called mirror neurons in our bodies that uh, neurologists have come to recognize and, under and understand that, that these neurons in our body that pick up what's being, you know, the emotions and feelings and nerves that are being fired in somebody else's body. This is why uh, when we're watching a movie, we can go on this emotional ride with characters on screen, for example. Um, so when you, when, if you are in a turned on state and it's clean, meaning you're not reaching and grasping, um, you're not ashamed, you're not feeling like there's something wrong, you're not worried or concerned, then she can just feel that turn on and it's more likely to help her feel turned on. If you are on those other things, well, it's more likely to trigger those types of feelings in her or at least a sense of discomfort within her. So it really is, this whole thing really is a call for self-growth. A commit, I mean, the fact that you're on here says that you have at least uh, more of a commitment to your self-work than your average person. And I invite you to commit even, even deeper to it. Commit, commit fully to your, uh, to your personal development, to your spiritual development, to your sexual development. And through that commitment, through that, that ever learning process, um, seek out teachers, seek out mentors, 
And again, you know, we to, to close up, I'm going to invite you one last time here. Do come to, uh, if you found value in this, we have been scratching the iceberg and it's also been primarily informational. Um, I invite you, evolvelivela.com. You're in front of a computer, now's a great time to go. EvolveLiveLA.com and uh, check out our trailer video. Uh, we put a lot of work into it, so please check it out. And uh, I, come, if this, if this is breathing anything for you, there's a reason. Uh, join, we have 300 people coming from, uh, from, well, so far, if you include North America, five continents, um, Frederick, who was on earlier, he's flying in from Sweden. We also have, uh, I believe, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, somewhere in South America. Um, I, ca I can't remember at the moment uh, that I've already bought tickets, and we're you know only halfway into our ticket sales. So uh, take the take the leap, take the leap. Uh, make it out here in January. Uh, you'll find that. Uh, I personally found that the, the types of things that I've had to make the most sacrifice for or go out of my way to make happen have often be, been the most powerful experiences of my life. I will do, I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that this will truly be a spiritual, sexual, a sexual spiritual transformation. Give it your all and you will find it to be the same. That said, EvolveLiveLA.com. You can find out more about me at DestinGarrick.com, D-E-S-T-I-N-G-E-R-E-K.com. Find me on Facebook by my name, Destin Garrick. I really uh, want to acknowledge you all for coming here today. It speaks of your own commitment to your growth and commitment to being part of the, ch the change. There is so much more available to you, and I know this because there, I continue to find so much more available to me, and I have committed full force to this whole journey. There's so much more available. Come join us. Be a part of this for yourself, for your partners, for your community, for the consciousness of this planet. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> EvolveLiveLA.com. Join now. Thank you.